As already mentioned, secondary structure analysis is probably the most common application of infrared spectroscopy in the life sciences. A widely used approach for this consists of the following steps. Step 1. The amide 1 component bands are identified, for example, from the minima in the second derivative spectrum. This provides the approximate band positions of the component bands as indicated by the arrows. Step 2. Component bands are placed at the identified band positions and the absorbent spectrum is fit. The band positions may or may not be allowed to vary during the fit. This provides the final positions, widths, areas and shapes of the component bands. An example of such a fit is shown on the right hand side. Step 3. From the final band positions, the bands are assigned to secondary structures using tables like the one shown earlier, which is reproduced here in small scale. Finally, in step 4, the band areas for each secondary structure are summed up and divided by the total area of all bands in the amide 1 region. This gives the secondary structure contribution of each secondary structure. While these four steps seem to be straightforward, there are a couple of requirements, limitations and problems associated with them. They will be discussed in the following. An important requirement for secondary structure analysis are good quality data. This requirement should actually be self-evident and applies to all research. Should you, for example, in your future career obtain data that are difficult to explain, then it is often better to spend time on a repeat of the measurement than to spend time on finding an explanation for the strange results. A repeat may simply show that something went wrong in the first experiment. A major problem for the analysis of the amide 1 absorption is the presence of water vapor bands. They arise from the humidity of the ambient air inside the infrared spectrometer, not from the liquid water that might be present in the sample. Because water vapor is a gas, absorption of an infrared photon simultaneously causes a vibrational transition and a rotational transition. I will not explain rotational vibrational spectra in detail here, because they are no property of the biological samples of interest which are typically not in the gas phase. I just want to mention that for each vibrational transition there are many rotational transitions possible with different transition energies. Therefore water vapor generates a series of sharp absorption bands which are arranged in two branches which are centered around 1600 reciprocal centimeters. This can be seen in the top spectrum which is dominated by water vapor signals. There are no sharp water vapor signals close to 1600 reciprocal centimeters. The absorption of the two branches can be seen right and left from 1600 reciprocal centimeters, here and there, with strong bands close to 1600 reciprocal centimeters and weaker bands further away. The figure shows four second derivative spectra of the same protein sample with different contributions of water vapor. In the green spectrum on the bottom, these contributions are very small and the spectrum reveals the component bands of the amide 1 spectrum between 1700 and 1600 reciprocal centimeters. In the other spectra, however, the sharp features from water vapor can easily be mistaken for protein features. As already mentioned, the top spectrum is dominated by water vapor bands and all protein features are hidden. Water vapor bands can easily be, be mistaken for protein bands and therefore care should be taken to avoid them. It is possible to subtract water vapor bands from protein spectra to some degree, but it is much better to make a good measurement without warp water vapor bands in the spectrum. This can be done by flowing dry air or nitrogen 
gas through the spectrometer so that the water vapor content inside is reduced considerably. An additional possibility is to use a sample shuttle. The sample shuttle inside the spectrometer moves the sample in and out of the infrared beam. This makes it possible to measure the sample and the reference spectrum without opening the spectrometer. Otherwise, one would first measure the reference spectrum, then open the sample chamber, put in the sample and measure its spectrum. This lets water vapor into the instrument, which first needs to be purged away before the sample spectrum can be measured. As mentioned, there is a small region around 1600 reciprocal centimeters, which is free of water vapor bands. Note also that there are no bands in the protein spectrum above 1750 reciprocal centimeters. These two characteristics can be used to identify water vapor bands in infrared spectra of proteins. Sharp bands everywhere except around 1600 reciprocal centimeters indicate water vapor bands. In contrast, the absence of sharp bands above 1750 reciprocal centimeters demonstrates little impact of water vapor on the spectrum. We will now discuss some limitations of secondary structure analysis. Secondary structure analysis tries to match experimental results with the concept of secondary structure. We all know what secondary structure is intuitively, but what is it really? The definition of secondary structure is not obvious and several definitions have been proposed. They generate secondary structure contents that can deviate a lot from definition to definition, in some cases by more than a factor of two. Even using the same definition may yield different secondary structure contents for different experimental structures of the same protein. The figure shows the secondary structure content of two different proteins, obtained by 12 different definitions for secondary structure. The red curve shows the alpha helical content of a helical protein and the blue curve the beta sheet content of a protein rich in beta sheet. The beta sheet content varies by more than a factor of two between different definitions. You compare this definition gives only 30% beta sheet content, <coughs> whereas this definition gives close to 80% beta sheet content. It was checked which of these definitions works well together with infrared spectroscopy and it was found that secondary structures assigned by the common DSSP method can be well predicted by infrared spectroscopy. Another limitation is that only the main secondary structures can be quantified from the amide one band. This was shown in an analysis of spectra from up to 92 proteins with known structure. Several statistical methods were applied and it was concluded that only three different types of secondary structure can be distinguished. These are alpha helix or ordered alpha helix, beta sheet or antiparallel beta sheet and other, which means neither alpha helix nor beta sheet. Further structures are hard to predict because they are rare and do not vary much throughout the dataset. Now I want to discuss a few problems associated with secondary structure analysis. We have already encountered that second derivatives are useful to identify component bands that are otherwise hard to detect in the amide one absorption spectrum. However, one has to be aware of a property that is illustrated in this slide. The black line shows a spectrum of three Gauss lines with different widths. The red line is the second derivative of that spectrum. While the maximum absorbance of the three Gauss lines is the same, the amplitude of the second derivative increases significantly with decreasing bandwidths. Thus, the second derivative enhances sharp features in the spectrum and suppresses broad features. This has advantages and disadvantages. First, 
The sharp bands of noise and water vapor are enhanced in the second derivative spectrum. Therefore, it is very important to start with spectra of good quality. Second, broad bands from mobile or heterogeneous structures are less obvious in second derivative spectrum. And third, the strong absorption of water in the amide 1 range is also suppressed. Therefore, small errors in the subtraction of the water absorption do not show in the second derivative spectrum. Not only the amide 1 vibrations absorb in the amide 1 range, also some side chains absorb here and contribute on average 20% to the integrated absorbance. Contribution varies substantially between different proteins depending on their side chain composition. The slide shows the spectra of two proteins. The dark blue line in the spectra is the spectrum of the side chains, which is calculated in this case. Contribution of the side change is stronger for the protein on the left hand side because it has relatively more side chains that absorb in the amide 1 range. Also, the shape of the side chain spectrum differs as shown in these two spectra. The side chain spectrum is different for the two proteins because arginine contributes more to the right spectrum. This is the arginine contribution. In contrast, aspartate and glutamate, shown by the red and orange curves, contribute more to the left spectrum. Thus, proteins with different side chain compositions will have different side chain spectra. However, the absorption of side change does not impose a severe problem for secondary structure analysis and the subtraction of the side chain spectrum has little effect on the obtained result. Now we come to a problem that may have rather the severe consequences. A fit to the absorption spectrum is often not very well defined because the spectrum is rather featureless. This is particularly problematic when many component bands are fitted. This slide shows what can go wrong and that you should not blindly believe a fit however good the result look like. The bottom spectra are absorbent spectra and the top spectra second derivative spectra. The starting spectrum is shown on the left. It is an artificial spectrum where the component bands are exactly known. Panel B in, a mi in the middle shows a fit to this absorption spectrum. Surprisingly, the original set of the component bands is not reproduced by the fit, which demonstrates that the best fit is not well defined. Deviations between the fitted set of component bands in panel B and the original component bands in panel A are indicated by the arrows. The band near 1634 reciprocal centimeters which is much stronger in the fit than in the original spectrum. This is also true for the band near 1675 reciprocal centimeters. In contrast, the band near 1655 reciprocal centimeters is weaker and more narrow than in the original spectrum. Simultaneous fitting of absorbance and second derivative spectrum is shown in panel C on the right hand side. It reproduces the original component bands much better. However, even this procedure is no guarantee to obtain the correct fit. The example shows that quite different sets of component bands produce very similar spectra. Small deviations between fit and original spectrum may therefore indicate a rather large mistake in the set of fitted component bands. It is better to consider all available spectral information in the fitting, which means that the second derivative should also be fitted. The next problem is that the assignment of component bands to secondary structure is not unique. As already mentioned, spectral regions of alpha helices and other structures overlap. Here in the table, alpha helix and irregular structures. 
Another ambiguity concerns hydrated helices, the absorption of which overlaps with that of beta sheets. The reason are additional hydrogen bonds between their carbonyl groups and water, which lead to a downshift of their amide 1 band. And this is an example for the effect of hydrogen bonding on the wave number of amide 1 vibrations. As a result of these ambiguities, there may be several possibilities to assign a given component band to a particular secondary structure, which may lead to an erroneous interpretation. In summary, we have discussed that the quality of the spectrum is important. In particular, there should be no signals from water vapor. There are several definitions for secondary structure, which will give deviating results. Only three main types of secondary structure can be distinguished by infrared spectroscopy, and these are alpha helix, beta sheet and other. The second derivative suppresses broadbands, which has advantages and disadvantages for the analysis. Side chains contribute about 20% to the absorbance in the amide 1 region, but this does not seem to be a problem for secondary structure analysis. Nevertheless, the side chain contribution needs to be considered for proteins with a high proportion of amino acids that absorb in the amide 1 range. A problem is that fitting the absorbent spectrum can be ambiguous. Also, the assignment of component bands to secondary structures can be ambiguous. Finally, the band area or, in or integrated absorbents may differ for different types of structure. I have not mentioned this earlier. In a final step of the analysis, the band areas of the different component bands are compared in order to calculate the percentage for each secondary structure. This assumes that the band area per residue is the same for all secondary structures, but this may not be the case. Nevertheless, secondary structure analysis works quite well in practice, when applied carefully. The average deviation from the true secondary structure was reported to be 4 to 12 percentage points. What this means is the following. When an alpha helix content of 30% is predicted and an error of 10 percentage points is assumed, then the true value is between 20 and 40%, not between 27 and 33%. In other words, the error is not 10% of 30%. While most researchers use the band fitting approach, Recent studies on the accuracy of the method use statistical methods, so it is not quite clear how good the band fitting approach actually is. We will encounter a second spectroscopic method to estimate the secondary structure content. This is circular dichroism. Generally, infrared spectroscopy and circular dichroism give similar results, but circular dichroism is better to predict alpha helices, whereas infrared spectroscopy is better for beta sheets. Not surprisingly, the combination of both gives the best results. When analyzing the secondary structure of a protein, under different conditions, the changes between the different conditions can probably be determined more accurately than the absolute values of secondary structure content. Finally, unusual structures will probably remain unnoticed and lead to wrong results. For example, not considering the possibility of hydrated helices will attribute all absorption in the lower wave number range to beta sheets, which might then be overestimated. Does all this sound complicated? Maybe yes. On the other hand, it makes secondary structure analysis more interesting because it requires some thinking. There's nothing more boring than a method that can be applied without using one's brain.